Matthew 21, we're gonna ver- we're gonna start at verse 33. So just put your finger there, and that's where we're gonna get started. Remember, Jesus is still addressing the religious leaders. This is what this this teaching is on them. The first parable he gave them was the fig tree in verse 19. The fig tree had no fruit. It had leaves, but it had no fruit. And what did he do? He cursed it. The second parable he gave them was in verse 28 through 31 about the two sons. One said he wouldn't go, but later he repented and went. The father wanted him to, uh, to go. And the other son said he would go, but didn't. So Jesus asked him, he said, which, which one of these two sons did the will of the father? And they said the first one, which was true, because he didn't, he said he wasn't going, but then he repented and he did go. But the, the second said he would go, but he never had intentions on going. He just lied to the father. And he's pointing out, you're just like him. Y'all are disobedient to my word. So he's, he's pointing, he, I mean, he's giving these parables, but he's making these parables to where they can see this is you. That's what he's teaching the religious leaders. Now Jesus is going to go even further to show them without a doubt that they're lost. They're not born again Christians. In verse 33, he's going to give them another parable. This one goes a little deeper. This one's a little harder. In verse 33, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a winepress in it and built a tower and led it out to the husbandmen and went into a four country. Now Jesus has already given them a parable about a, the vineyard and now he's giving them another and we're going to find out that the husbandmen, the religious leaders. In verse 34, And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. Now the fruits here are more believers in the Lord. That's what the Lord was expecting. These religious leaders to have more believers didn't happen. So let me show you through the scriptures what the vineyard is. In Isaiah, this book is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah wrote this song. And in Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 2 and 7, it says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. The beloved is the Lord, is Jesus. Verse 2, And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Instead of the vineyard, the vineyard bringing good grapes, it brought forth bitter grapes. We're going to see that the wild grapes are the religious leaders. Like this, this is a parable, but as we go, we're going to see who the Lord's speaking to. In verse 7, for the, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So the vineyard is the house of Israel. And the man of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And I'm going to read this out of Living Bible. It's a little bit easier to understand. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of Heaven's army. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. Now we know what the vineyard is. It's Israel. And the cries he heard were the people who were, who were being put under a lot of stress with, with the religious leaders' traditions. They were put under a lot of stress. And what I mean about this, the religious leaders think they're perfect. They thought they were perfect. They thought they were up here and everybody else was down here. Like they were like, like trash to them. You know, look up to us because of who we are. And that's... That's why the Lord said, I heard their cries, because the, the believers, which not of them were believers, but the ones that were, had to follow the religious leaders, because that's what they did. 
That's what Israel did. They followed the religious leaders. Another place we see that the vineyard is Israel is in Psalms 80 verse 8. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Now who did he bring out of Egypt? Israel. So it's another place where we're seeing that the vineyard is Israel. These religious leaders were trusted by God and were given a great opportunity. They were given a great opportunity to get blessings from God by taking care of Israel to lead them in the Lord's way. But instead they led them in their way. They weren't content with just receiving blessings from God, doing it God's way. They wanted Israel for themselves. Like, they, like I said, they wanted the Jews to look up to them. They didn't want to point them to the Lord. I mean, they did it in a, such a way that it still put them on top. Because of us, you can, you can see God. Okay? Because of us. So that's the way the religious leaders were. They wanted to be look, looked up to. They wanted the glory. And of course, we have preachers like that today. They stand at the door. In some places, people kiss their hands. I mean, they almost bow down and worship them, almost. And these men, these men, they let it happen. They don't tell them, oh no, don't worship me, don't bow down to me. There's only one you worship. There's only one you bow to, down to, and that's God. Mm -hmm. But no, they don't do that. They accept this glory for themselves. That's why I say it still goes on today. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. Now we can see that after Jesus, there is no other way to the Father. Because he says it right here. But last of all, so this is, this is it. Jesus is it. If anybody's waiting for anything else, it's not going to happen. Jesus is the final. To get to heaven, you got to go through Jesus. There's nobody else after that. Verse 38. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, There is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us siege on his inheritance. This verse right here shows that the religious leaders recognized Jesus as the Son of God. They recognized him as the Son of God, but yet they, were, they kept asking him, Who are you? They kept saying, even at his trials, they were saying, who are you? Right here, it says it plainly. They recognized him. They wanted his inheritance. This was premeditated murder. They didn't make a mistake, mistaking him as another servant that the Lord sent. They knew exactly who Jesus was. The, these religious leaders wanted the kingdom, but they wanted it to take it by force. Now we can understand what Matthew 11:12 says. This verse right here, a lot of people, a lot of people misinterpret this verse. But now we're going to see what it means. It says, "And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence take it by force." Since John the Baptist started to preach, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand," he and many others were being prosecuted for their belief. Like I said, the biggest murder was the heir, Jesus. And that is exactly what 30, verse 38 means. The religious leaders wanted to take it by force. You have many Christians that say, we need to take the kingdom by, for, by force. The, us, the Christians. That's not what it says here. The religious leaders are the ones who want to take it by force, by killing Jesus. So now we know what that verse means. So now when you hear it and someone's saying, you know, oh, we, we need to take the kingdom by force, you can go, uh, no, that's not what the scripture says. Verse 39, And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Jesus is prophesying here of his death when he said that, that they're going to kill him. And it says that they were going to cast him out of the vineyard, which here it's speaking about Jerusalem which is Israel, and they did. Hebrews 13, verses 11 through 13. This, this is going to be speaking about how they're going to they're gonna cast them out of the city. And they did. They, they took them out to the hills to uh, crucify them. But it says right here, under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of the animals into the holy place 
as a sacrifice for sin. And the bodies of the animals were burnt outside the camp, meaning outside the city. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So right here, it, 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 it says it. Just like they took the animals out of the city, they did the same thing to Jesus. I mean, they did that to the blood, animal blood sacrifices, did the same thing to Jesus. They took him out of the city to, to sacrifice him. And then verse 40, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, now this Lord, that's, that's the, that doesn't mean God. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Remember, Jesus is telling them about the religious leaders in a parable. Again, we're going to see Jesus trap them. And they're going to be judging themselves. Verse 41, And they said unto him, We will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Now this is what the religious leader said. Just like when David said, that man ought to be killed. And the prophet told him, you're that man. Well, the, Jesus is doing the same thing right here to them. Yeah, they're saying, well, that, you know, this is what you need to do to him. And right here, Jesus is going to show them, you're the one. They were completely unaware that they were setting their own trap up. That's Jesus, huh? I mean, yeah, man. <laughs> you can't fool him. You can't trap him. But he can trap you. They're calling themselves wicked men without even knowing it. Then they said that the vineyard should be given to another husbandman. The meaning of that is in Matthew 22, verses 8 and 9. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Speaking about the Jews here, about Israel, you know, they did not accept Jesus Christ as the, as the Messiah. So he's saying right there, those that were bidden, those who were invited, were invited they didn't come. And in verse 9, it says, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them bid to, to the marriage. So the Lord saying, Since Israel did not accept me, I came to them, and they did not want to come to the wedding. He's saying, Now go out, whoever wants to come. Now, that's where salvation came in for us, the Gentiles. Since they didn't take it, God said, Okay, I'm going to offer it to whoever wants it. I'll invite him to the wedding. Thank you, Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the Jews for being idiots. In verse 42, Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus tells them, Don't you read the scriptures? And they, like I said before, they had to learn the first, memorize the first five books of the Bible. The book of Psalms and most of the major prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they had to remember all that. But like I said before, you can have it in the brain, in your mind, what the scriptures say. But unless you put it in the heart, it does absolutely nothing good for you. It doesn't help you whatsoever when you know all about them, but you don't put it in the heart. Jesus is pulling no punches here. Jesus reminded them of Psalms 118 verse 22. The stone which the builders refused, has become the headstone of the corner. Now the cornerstone is the most important part of the building. Without it, the building would be unstable. This is talking about physical building without a cornerstone. We see that the stone is Jesus Christ here though. He is the stone. And the builders who, and the builders who rejected him were the Jewish leaders. Peter declared it unto them in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. This is another illustration. It says, Let it be known to all of you and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone, and there is no salvation, excuse me, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. What's another way of saying what's happening right here in this parable? The builders rejected that stone, which is the religious leaders. And again in Ephesians chapter 2, 
verses 19 and 20, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being chief cornerstone. So we know without a doubt that Jesus is, is the cornerstone here. It's talking about Jesus. And one more is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and 8. Wherefore also is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded, meaning disgraced. Verse 7, Unto you, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now they stumbled because they didn't obey God's words. That's what it says here. They're not the only ones who will meet this faith, the religious leader, but anyone who rejects the Lord now, anybody who rejects Jesus, this was going to happen to them. With these scriptures, there's no doubt, like I said, that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Jesus is telling the religious, leader, religious leaders, you are the wicked husbandman. That's what he's telling them. And he tells them, you are right. You deserve to be destroyed. That's what they said, that this should happen to the husbandman. They said he should be destroyed. And Jesus said, you're right. You're right. They should be destroyed. He's talking to them. And then a little further down, in Matthew 23, verses 29 through 33, and I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible. It's much easier to understand. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. Now Jesus, now the Lord is talking to the religious leaders here. For you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decorate the mon monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. Then you say, if we had lived in those days of our ancestors, we would never have joined them in killing the prophets. But in saying that, you testify against yourselves that you are indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead and finish what your ancestors started. Snakes, sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of hell? I mean... If, if, if someone's telling me this, I mean, I, I'm a, it's going to scare me. I'm going to go, oh, and, you know, I'm going to repent or do something. Yeah. But I don't know what's wrong with these religious leaders. Well, I can't say I don't know what's wrong with them. They're just like the lost people now. Yeah. They don't want to hear it. They just don't want to hear the truth. <clears throat> Verse 43, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now the word nation means people here. And in 1 Peter 2.9, I'll show you that it means people. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He's talking about Christians here. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Like I said, he's speaking about Christians when he... <clears throat> in this verse, he's called us out of darkness. And John fifteen five, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. This is a strong verse right here. Mm -hmm. Without the Lord, we can't do anything. <clears throat> Only with the Lord can we have the bring forth fruits. And without Jesus. <clears throat> We, bring, we can't bring forth fruit, fruit, the righteousness, that's what it's talking about, of God. We can't bring His righteousness out and bring it to people and, and bear more fruit, more Christians, more believers. As I said before, without the Lord, beginning of the uh, teaching, I showed without the Lord, we have no righteousness. We have none. It says right here, we can do nothing without the Lord. Oh, I can be a good person. No. God said you can do nothing without Him. So those people who think their goodness or being good is, is enough, mm -mm, it's not. Without the Lord, 
we can do nothing. That's what it says. The unbelieving religious leaders wouldn't repent of their sin. And because of that, they couldn't bring forth the fruit. Like the fig tree, like I said. And it was cursed. And they will be also. Verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, for me to explain this, I'm going to go to the Old Testament to show you what this verse means. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, the reason I point out that verse, because when, when in the verse in Isaiah 8, a little further down, when it says he, that he is talking about Jesus, because that's what, that's what we just read. You know, Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. So who is that virgin? Mary. Mary. And she conceived who? Jesus. The Son of God. And his name will be Emmanuel. So from, from, from this point on, where it says he, it's talking about Jesus, okay? Isaiah 8, verses 14 and 15. And he shall be a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel, for a gig and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. And he shall be for a sanctuary. That's meaning those that are truly born again of God, we don't need to fear evil. We're under God's protection. We don't need to fear evil. Amen. Amen. And Jesus is a stone and a rock of stumbling and of an offense to Israel and Judah. That's what he's talking about right here. For the, which he's talking about the ungodly. He's, he's a stone. He's a rock of stumbling for the ungodly, for the non-believers. Instead of growing by the word of God, they are offended by it. Okay? And to them, he is a gig, gin, and a snare, meaning he is a terror to them. The Lord's going to be a terror to these lost people. Right. They just don't know it yet. They will stumble for being disobedient to the word, and because of that, they will be broken. This is what this, is, what this verse was uh, that I'm talking about in Matthews. I'm explaining it in Isaiah. The bottom line for verse 44 is... When we take and accept the words of God, He will break us from our old ways. He's going to break us, but He's breaking us from our old ways. Right. But for those who don't accept Him, His wrath will bring them to destruction. That's when it says, but He will fall on them. That's what it's talking about. When He falls on the lost, the wicked, they're going to be brought down to destruction. Hope you understood. Mm -hmm. Verse 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> really? When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard, heard what he was saying, they perceived that he spoke of them. Man, you don't need much sense on that, do you? But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Jesus showed them their sin. That's what he's doing here. Instead of falling like on their knees, like I said, and repenting, they wanted to kill him. Just like it says in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. And all day in the synagogue, so everyone in the church, when they heard these things, this is Jesus preaching in the church. When they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were offended. Verse 29, And rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him onto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. So, these religious leaders was doing exactly what happened in Luke. Jesus went into a church, and he offended the people there, and they wanted to kill him. And this is exactly what the religious leaders are doing here. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him a prophet. They wanted to lay hands on him, and we're not talking about healing them either. Laying hands on him, they wanted to kill him. That's what they wanted to do. 
these are the kind of religious leaders we need to be aware of because they're not out to give us they're not out to give the glory and the power to the Lord these religious like leaders like I said they want it for themselves they want the glory they want the power and that's what we need to be aware of be aware of these are what you call wolves which in Matthew 715 beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are raven wolves that verse Christians need to read this verse Christians the danger of false prophets or they have great deceptions great deceptions they have no mercy they're very clever now these are the wolves and all they're after is your money and your possessions that's all they want this is the wolf they're not they don't care one bit about your salvation they're wolves they're deceitful and they're in sheep's clothing so they're hard to recognize they are hard to recognize these wolves they look and act very religious but inwardly the Lord says they're swindlers they want to swindle you out of whatever you have whatever money you have I don't care if you're just a poor little old lady they're gonna want what you got that's all they're there for false preachers are pleasant you know none of these false prophets I mean well false prophets false preachers none of these wolves look like the devil they don't have horns on their head by looking at them you think they're they're men of God they're pleasant and they're positive they like being around Christians to talk like them so they can be accepted as a Christian that's what they do am I telling the truth here this is the Word of God Jesus they know the scriptures I mean these religious men know the scriptures so you get someone up there and they start quoting scriptures to you oh this must be a man of God but we need to remember this who quoted the scriptures to Jesus when he was being tempted for 40 days and 40 nights the devil in Matthew 4 6 and saith on this is the devil and saith unto him if thou be the son of God cast thyself down for it is written when he said for it is written he's quoting the scriptures here the devil is quoting the scriptures he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone so I'm showing you right here the devil is quoting the scriptures to Jesus so these wolves these religious leaders they know the scriptures so because you hear them and they're quoting scriptures to you that doesn't mean anything right. we have to be very very aware who we listen to this is why the Lord tells us in 2nd Timothy 2 15 the Lord says study study to show thyself approved unto God this is why I push for Christians to study their Bible because if we don't and we let man tell us what God says we will we will be in danger of being under a wolf and we won't even know it that's why we need to study the only way it is possible for a Christian the elect to be fooled is if they don't study the words of God if you study the words of God if you know what the words of God say you'll know when a wolf comes about you and and, he, and he, he'll quote the scriptures, but he'll totally take it out of context. But you'll know that because you've studied. So we can know when the words that are spoken to us are from the Lord by studying. John 10, verses 27 and 28. This is, this is Christians, okay? God is saying to the Christians, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You get a wolf, and you start listening to him, he's going to pluck you out of Jesus' hand. But God says right here, but the Lord says right here, if you know, you hear my voice. We know the voice of God by studying, by reading his words. That's how we know the voice of God. Because we don't actually hear him like y'all hear me now. That's not the way we hear him, but we know his voice. Why? Because we study the words. We study the words. So because of that, God says, if you do that, no man can pluck you out of my hand. Amen? Amen.
Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 through 15, But I will continue doing what I have always done. This will undercut those who are looking for an opportunity to boast that their work is just like ours. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I am not surprised. Even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Talking about the demons. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. So these false religious leaders, these wolves, they're going to get what they deserve. But right now, believe me, they're after you. They're after your money and everything that you can give them. That's what they want. And like I've said before, not only that, they know where they're going. They know they're in already. So they want to take down as many as they can with them. That's what they want. Jesus tells us in Acts 20, verse 29 and 31, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw you away disciples of, after them. Therefore watch, and remember, by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. So Paul's saying right here, we need to watch. We need to be watchful for these for these false prophets, these false teachers, these wolves, these false religious leaders. He said to watch. We need to watch out for them. He said, for three years I've warned y'all. Day and night I've done this. He said, I don't, I've done it with tears. Crying to the people, be watchful. They're out there. They look just like Christians, they act just like Christians. But if you know the Word of God, you will not be deceived. How many Christians know the Word of God? Don't answer that. I'm going to tell you. Very little. So there are going to be many Christians who are going to be deceived. Now I'm not going to say they're going to lose their salvation if they're really born again, but they're, they're not going to walk with the Lord. And then the other ones who are lost, well, they're just going to continue being lost and wicked because they're not being fed the Word of God. The Scripture also tells us that there are people who, who don't care. They don't care if they're under a wolf. They don't mind being deceived. How do I know that? I know it because of the Scriptures. They like the lies that they're being told. They like it because it makes them feel good. The Lord tells Isaiah, He tells them about rebellious Judah. In Isaiah, verse, chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to read the whole thing because we need to hear it. Woe to rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that, they, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and they have not asked at my mouth, meaning they didn't seek the Lord's will, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. What he's saying that the the Jews went to Pharaoh to be strengthened by him, to use his strength to help them, and to trust in the shadow of the Egypt. Verse three Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his prince were at Zion, and his ambassadors came to hands. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them. He's saying there's the, the Pharaoh in Egypt, they could not profit the, the, the Christians, the believers, nor be able to help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. Egypt will not help them. Instead, they will be a disgrace to them, is what it's saying right here. In verses 6 and 7, it's a prophecy. It talks about the end times. But in verse 8, the Lord continues. Now go, write it before them in a table, and not in a book, that it may be for the time to cover forever and ever, meaning this will be until the end of time, that this rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, meaning 
Stop seeing visions. He's, they're telling the prophets, stop seeing visions. We don't want to know about your visions. That's what they're saying here. And to the, to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto <coughs> us smooth things. Prophecy deceits. They're saying it right here. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. That's why I know there's Christians, there's, there's people out there, they don't mind being deceived. They don't mind being lied to. Just like it says right here. I got it from the scriptures. There's people out there who don't care they're being deceived. So I'm not just saying that out of my mouth. It's not my opinion. It's the scriptures. God said it right here. Tell us nice things. Tell us, tell us lies. That's what these scriptures are saying. There's other verses. I'm not, I could go into them, but I'm just going to give them to you. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is what the Lord is telling us. I send you forth in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Ready to defend what you believe. But then be as doves. Be gentle to those who want to hear the word of God. There's a time to be strong, mighty in the Lord. But then there's a time to be, like it says here, harmless as doves. To be sweet. To talk. Uh, loving. You understand what I'm saying? Kindly. That's what we should be doing. We're out in the midst of wolves. So we know when we need to know when to be strong. But then we also know when to be gentle. Luke 10 verse 3. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. God, God is telling you, hey, I'm sending you out there. But the reason I'm sending you out there because you know my voice. And like I said, the only way we're going to know His voice is by reading His words. Right. That's the only way. If we don't read His words, we don't know His voice. But He's saying, hey, I'm going to send you out there amongst wolves. But because you know me, because you know my voice, you got sanctuary. We don't have to fear evil. Amen? Amen. These are for Christians who are really truly born again. These are for Christians who really want to walk with the Lord. These are for Christians who want to be out there on the battlefield fighting against the devil and his demons to try to reach people to the Lord. Like I said before, you can, you're a football player. You can be out there on the football field fighting the enemy or you can be on the bench and being a bench warmer not doing nothing for the Lord. Me, myself, I've chose to be out on the field. Mm -hmm. I chose to be out there in the battle. I have no problem with it. I've been doing it for years. I have no problem. And is it because of me? No. It's because the Lord, I allow the Lord to work through me. To fill me with the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can come out and tell these people, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Who, who heard that? How many of us can say that? Now think about it. How many of us can say, I am not ashamed of the gospel? And when you say that, you're saying, hey, I am going to witness to whoever comes my way. Because I am not ashamed. Whoever the Lord brings my way, I'm going to witness to them. Because I don't want their blood on my hands. Just like I explained to Hunter the other night. Ezekiel 3.18, it talks about warning, warning the wicked. The Lord says if we don't warn the wicked of their wicked ways, their blood is on our hand. For not warning them. And then in Acts 20, verse 26, Paul says, I am pure from the blood of all men. See, he's referring all the way back to the Old Testament, to Ezekiel. When it talks about the blood, he's saying, I'm pure from the blood of all men, saying, I have witnessed to everyone the Lord has brought my way. Nobody's going to hell because I didn't warn them. Is that the way we want to be? Mm -hmm. That's the way we want to be. That's the way we should be. And that's what the Lord is looking for from us. So I want to please the Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to please the Lord. I want to go out there on the battlefield and witness. And talk about my father. I'm not ashamed of my father. I am proud of my father. He has saved me from hell. Mm -hmm. He has cleaned me up because I would be dead. There's no doubt in my mind I'd be dead right now. Because my two best friends that I was running around with, they're dead. I gave my life to the Lord, but they didn't. They're gone. So I know I would have followed right with them. But because the Lord opened my eyes and I recognized who he was and I accepted him, I'm still here today. And because of that, I'm going to do whatever I can in the power of the Holy Spirit to reach people for the Lord. Because I'm getting sick and tired of Satan 
winning the battles. Christians, wake up. Read the Word of God. That's the only way you're going to be strong in the Lord, is by reading the Word of God. If you don't read the Word of God, these wolves are going to attack you, and you're not even going to know it. Because they're so sweet, they're so religious, they're so kind, but they're nothing but a deception, they're deceitful, and all they want from you is what you have. Acts 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Not sparing the flock. They don't care what they do to you. In fact, they want destruction for you. That's what the devil wants. He's, he's a master at it. All he wants is destruction for you. We need to learn how to study the Bible. And the only way we're going to do that is by studying it. Not by another man teaching you. Now, like I said before, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will guide you. And that's true. So what a man of God, when he's led by the Holy Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit guiding you. It's not like the Holy Spirit is going to come down, to, down here and talk to you himself. Because we can't see the Holy Spirit. But it lives in us. And men of God, when they teach, it's the Holy Spirit teaching through them. But it's got to be a man of God. Make sure it's a man of God that you're listening to. Check them out. Don't just listen to anybody because they got pastor in front of their name or whatever title they have in front of their name or whatever initials they have by their name behind their name. That means absolutely nothing. Nothing. I hope y'all listening to me. That means nothing. Look at the man. Look at his walk with the Lord. Does he praise the Lord? Does he give all credit to the Father? Read the Bible. I've showed you through the scriptures. The devil wants you. And the devil doesn't look like the devil. Remember, the devil was the prettiest angel in heaven. So this horn things that the world has made the devil to be is totally opposite from that. He is one of the most beautiful angels in heaven. So the devil's not going to come to you like you think. You're not going to recognize him unless you're in the Word. Amen?